We'll uh, start. So welcome to the last class. All right, so a couple of logistical things. Uh, so project was originally due today, but uh, as we discussed last class, you can take a little longer uh, with your project. So the deadlines are, I added them to Moodle, but it's the same as I hope what we said in class. Um, so if you uh, are yourself or in a team uh, with a student that's graduating, uh, give it to me on Monday, uh, by end of day, anytime. Uh, and then I'll mark it before your exam, and then when I get your exam, I can uh, have your mark to you quicker. Uh, and then if you are not in that case, uh, then you can take until Friday. Okay. Uh, another thing is uh, normally office hours are tomorrow, Thursday. I won't be, I have a conflict uh, with office hours tomorrow. Uh, because it's also the last office hour and a lot of students have like questions right before the exam, I'll move it till Monday so it also gives you extra time to study. Uh, if, you, if there's something pressing, like maybe it's about your project and your project's due Monday and you want to ask me about it before Monday, that's totally fine. Just shoot me an email and we can either discuss it over email or I can set up a special uh, time. Uh, and then in terms of the exam itself, uh, so it will be a week from today, uh, Wednesday, December 6th. Uh, it will start at 2 p.m. Uh, you can, it's scheduled for three hours. We have the room for three hours, so you can stay for three hours. Uh, it's, you're split into two rooms, so check back on Moodle, uh, maybe on Monday or sometime before the exam, and I'll say who goes to what room. Usually, either I just randomly assign you to a room, then I'll post a PDF, or sometimes I just do it by last name. Like, if your last name is between A and M, go to this room. Uh, otherwise, go to the other room. Uh, I mentioned these details before, but I'll just go over them. Uh, so the exam will consist of short answer, and it will consist of multiple choice. Uh, the short answer, you'll answer on the question sheet itself. And then you'll have a separate uh, Scantron form, which is those like forms that have like the circles or whatever. And uh, you can uh, fill out uh, the multiple choice on the Scantron. A computer will mark your multiple choice. I'll mark uh, the short answer. Uh, it needs pencil. Uh, so even if you have a dark pen, it doesn't always work. Um, I mean, if, if it doesn't work, I'll mark it manually. Uh, but, but it's better for me for the computer to be able to see it. Uh, so please use pencil, uh, bring a pencil. I'll have extra pencils if you need them. The short answer, you can also write in pencil. It makes sense because then you can erase things and, and, and things like that. So, uh, but you, you're free to write it in pen as well. Um, you can bring a cheat sheet. So one page, pa piece of paper, normal size, letter size, front and back. Uh, and you can put whatever you want on that. And uh, if English isn't your first language and you're concerned uh, and you want to have a dictionary or something like that, that's also acceptable. And uh, if you are scared about having to do some mental math uh, and you want to have a calculator, that's fine. I don't think there's a single question that has any math at all, but it, if you want to have it just to feel comfortable, uh, then that's fine as well. So I I think that's about it. Uh, some people asked about sample questions. Uh, so I put some questions, but these are like really old, like like 10 years old. Um, so a bunch of them are on things that aren't even taught in this course. The course changed a lot, but some of them are relevant. So things like this, you can expect a question like this where there'll be like some sort of statement and then you have to say like in stride, whether it's an S-T-R-I-D-E. Um, some of these are, are about things that we talked about. Um, this is not relevant anymore. There's some questions about cookies. I, th I think they're more or less the same. Uh, and then I, I forget what all is here, but you can just go through them. If, if it's talking about things and you have no idea what it's talking about, like return-oriented programming, just you can assume that it's not part of the course anymore. So anyway, so that's... I, usually I don't post this, but enough people ask that, I, I mean, you can have it. It might be helpful, it might not be helpful. Uh, okay, uh, anything else? Any other questions about things? Okay. All right, then we'll uh, go into the, the last lecture itself. Just make 
make sure there's nothing else here. Okay, so in today's class, we'll wrap up uh, not just the course, but we'll, we'll wrap up this idea of uh, policies as well. So last class, we looked at browser policies. This class will be very similar. We're going to look at what's called the same origin policy. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between the two policies. They're designed for, for slightly different things. And in some of the examples I give, we'll, we'll kind of look at both uh, together. Okay, so just in terms of review, uh, Netscape was an early internet browser and they were the first to sort of standardize a bunch of things and those things we still have today. So there has been some evolution of them, but more or less uh, they've, the, the basic principles are still the same since 1994 and 1995. So in 1994, they invented this idea of cookies. Uh, they wrote the code for like handling cookies in the browser and things like that. And then they have a cookie policy which dictates when do you send the cookie or when do you not send the cookie essentially. Uh, same origin policy came a year later, a lot of overlap. Both of them, the, this idea of origin is, is uh, important to both. So cookies and origin is like which site gave you the cookie. So that's an important component in your decision about whether you send the cookie or not. Same origin is the same, but this is for uh, what we call active resources. Uh, so the, the main thing is JavaScript. You can just think about JavaScript. So uh, you get JavaScript. Say you have a website and you pull in a library from here and a library from there and a library from there, then what do you, how does it all work together? Can the libraries see each other? Can they see the website, the data on the website? Can they interact with it? You know, what, you know, we need some policies for, for dictating this kind of thing. Okay, so another thing to recall from last class are, um, when uh, something comes down, I, I, I send a request and I get back something from the server. Uh, it could go in the request too, but let's just, it's easiest to think about the response that I get back. Uh, the response that I get back will consist of a header and then there'll be the actual thing itself, okay? So headers are where the cookies are. Uh, there's other stuff uh, that we mentioned last class that are in the headers, but cookies are the main thing. And then the, the stuff that you're getting back is usually something like an HTML page, uh, a CSS file, which would be a style file, uh, an image or a video or an audio file. Uh, so all of these things are considered, actually, sorry, all of them except for the CSS are considered static, meaning that you just display them. The browser displays it to you and it's not really a threat to you, okay? There's nothing it could do that would threaten uh, your ability to see the website as the person who sent it intended for you to see it. Uh, CSS is now a little more powerful uh, than it used to be. And so now browsers consider it active content. So there is a threat there. Um, and then things like JavaScript uh, are, uh, are very threatening because the JavaScript is very powerful and it can do a lot. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about what it, what it can do and what it can't do. Okay, so what happens is on a modern website, it used to be you just get one HTML file and that was the website. Maybe there's some images or something like that. But now with the modern web, you pull down a file, you pull down some JavaScript, you pull down images, they're all from different servers. You kind of weave it all together, okay? And so what the browser does is it goes through every single resource that you received. And what it's gonna do is it's going to create a data structure to keep track. Okay, this is a resource, I got it over HTTPS and it came from this place. That, that kind of stuff is, is what it keeps track of, okay? And then what we're gonna have is a policy that basically says uh, who can see what, and also like in terms of editing. So like could, could JavaScript that's running on the website, could it change the image that got pulled down, right? If it wanted to, right? And so that's uh, what, what we need. Okay, so you go to a website, the browser is going to look at every resource and it's going to tag what's called its origin, okay? Now its origin might not be what you think, okay? So that this is why 
uh, we're doing a whole lecture on the same origin policy because uh, the mental model for what you think it might, how you think it might work and how it actually works is slightly different. Um, so the resources, the browser breaks them down. The data structure is called the DOM tree. You might have heard that term. Uh, you can look at it. So if you do that inspect element thing that we've done before, uh, you can see the DOM tree and you can see all the different elements uh, in it. And uh, the most important thing is that scripts can ask to read to the DOM tree. So they can say, OK, I'm in the DOM tree somewhere because I'm a resource myself, but can I move up the tree and go over and look at all the images that are on the web page or things like that? And beyond uh, reading, it can also write. So it can write new resources into the DOM tree. It could change resources that are in the DOM tree. Okay? So the, the JavaScript is powerful enough in order to do that. Okay? What this means is that JavaScript, the, the server could send you down one version of a website that looks a certain way, and JavaScript, the script that's running on that page, could basically re-render the site completely. Everything that's on that website uh, can be um, go. everything on that website can be uh, completely changed by JavaScript. Okay, so it's uh, um, and it's not when I say change the website. This is also something I have to be careful about. What I mean is I'm not, you're not changing the website as it was served to you by the server. So the server sends you a website. Okay, so sometimes when you say change the website, you mean change it on the server end. Okay, I'm not talking about that. It's being changed when, it, when the browser on the client side is rendering the website for a view. Okay, so, so if a different person goes to the same website, then they won't necessarily see the same thing that you see. <clears throat> okay, so the basic story is that a bad script, a malicious script, could rewrite the entire website uh, that the user sees in their browser. And it's, it's done browser side. So it's every, the JavaScript is running in the browser itself. OK, so before we get to the policy itself, uh, I mentioned resources are tagged with the origin that they're received from. Um, so what does this mean? So what it, the browser is going to do is it's going to say, OK, I have this image. This is the name of the image. And here's the origin. Okay, and the origin is sort of what you would expect. Like I got it from images.google.com. That's the origin. Okay, technically it's a little more specific, so it's going to include that domain, images.google.com. It will also include the protocol uh, that you received it over, uh, which would typically be HTTP or HTTPS, but it could could be some other protocol, I suppose. And then also there's this notion of ports. Uh, so normally, HTTP would come over one port. Uh, HTTPS always comes over another port. And then there's other ports for other kind of protocols, OK? Uh, so the port will also be considered. And then there's this override flag that, that I'll explain later, OK? So for example, HTTP, I go to test.popspy.com. Uh, I visit it over HTTP. HTTP always goes over port 80. Uh, so then that would be the origin. So that's what the browser remembers about this resource. It says, okay, I have this resource and, and it came from this protocol, this domain, this port, and then the override flag we'll, we'll discuss later. Okay, and then what does it mean to be a same origin? Very simply, if I get two images and they both say HTTP test.popspy.com 80 false, then they're the same origin, okay? If they say anything different, they're different origin, okay? So that would include, for example, let's say I have something that came over HTTPS, port 443 instead of 80. That's different, so that's a different origin, okay? Uh, if it came from popspy.com instead of test.popspy.com, that's a different origin, okay? So basically any, any difference at all is consequential and then it's no longer considered the same origin. Um, now, you might say, well, uh, let me just go back to the example. You might say, well, actually, I have some resources. They're coming from popspy.com, and I'm mixing them with resources that are coming from test.popspy.com, but I want them to, to be the same origin. From my perspective, that's the same origin. Um, and so the question is, could the resources that are sent down from test.popspy.com or fetched 
Uh, could could you override that and say, I know you're getting it from tesla.popsy.com, but could you just mark it as coming from popsy.com instead? Okay. And so the answer is yes. So you can do that. So the website, the base website that you're downloading, it can set what are called origins uh, for things uh, if it wants the origin to be different uh, than what the browser would normally mark it as. Um, there's some rules about what you can do. So you can't change it from pulpspy.com to concordia.ca. You can't just completely change the origin. Um, but what you can do that's very natural is, for example, if the origin is a subdomain, you can say actually record it as belonging to the super domain. Uh, not all the way up to like .com, but just up to the, the top level. Sorry, not up to the top level domain, but just up to the domain itself. So the way you would do it is, uh, for example, you would set document.domain equals popspy.com. You would do that in an HTML file that was at, uh, I forget what it was, test.popspy.com or whatever, and then it overrides uh, the domain for that, for that purpose. Um, and then what you do, that's what that flag is for. So once you do that, then the flag gets flipped, and uh, now it's considered true. OK. Um, now, there's a small technicality that, that sometimes, you know, people get in trouble with that, that they, they, when they're trying to debug things uh, and things aren't working the way they, they think it works. Uh, let's say that, that you have resource A and it came from test.popspy.com, but test.popspy.com overrode the, the domain and changed it to popspy.com, okay? Then its origin is going to look exactly like this, okay? It came over HTTP. It came to popspy.com, it came over port 80, and it, this is the result of it being overridden, okay? So that's true, okay? Now let's say you have a second resource and it's actually from popspy.com over HTTP, okay? Its origin will look like HTTP popspy.com 80, but the flag will be false because it didn't have to override it, okay? Those will be considered different origins. All right, so those are not the same origin. Now, if you want them to be the same origin, the fix is very simple, which is even though you're already at pulpspy.com, you can set the domain to also be pulpspy.com. So you're sort of overriding it, but you're not actually changing it. Now they're both overridden, so they both have that flag set to be true, and then now they're both the same. So anyways, that's a small like technicality with this. So some examples just to make this uh, concrete. Um, so these are the same. Uh, the same, uh, the same origin. Uh, they both come over HTTPS, and the domain is exactly the same. Um, if I went here and I set uh, document, actually, yeah, okay. If I, if, if I, if you're getting something from users.encs.concordia.ca, but it's set document to encs.concordia.ca, that's valid. It's allowed to do that. It's allowed to set it as a super domain of itself. And then you get something that's actually from encs.concordia.ca, then they're not the same because the first one, that overridden flag was set to true, and the second one, it's set to false. Okay? But if I simply do the same thing on the other, so I set the domain to what the domain already is, so it's not actually really changing anything, the only thing that that changes is it flips the flag to true. Now they're considered the same domain. Okay. Uh, and then I, I, I was thinking, sorry, that I had all of these, uh, but, but I seem to not have it. So uh, the first two are the only two that are the same. Everything else is different from the first one. So the, the third one is different uh, because it comes over HTTP, not over HTTPS. Uh, the next one's different because the subdomain is different. Uh, and then this one's different because it's a super domain of this. So the, the domain is also different, okay? So of these five things, the only two that are the same origin would be the first two. Everything else is a different origin. Okay, questions about that? All right. Okay, now let's just set this thing aside for a minute. We'll come back to origins in a second. Now let's think about a slightly different, um, uh, a different breakdown. So let's say that I have a website and I want to use JavaScript in my website, okay? So I'm going to pull JavaScript and I'm going to put it in my website. How do I actually do that? How do I put the JavaScript in my website? 
And the answer is that there's a couple of different ways of doing it, and there'll, there'll be consequences for the same origin policy when we, when we actually talk about it, okay? So the first thing I can do is I can actually embed the script straight up in the website. So I'm at concordia.ca, that's the domain. I have an HTML file, I have a script tag, and inside the script I have my JavaScript and it's sitting right there, okay? Now, when the browser parses it, it will pull out that script and say, this is a script resource, okay? Because it's between those tags, script and uh, on, non-script, uh, unscript or whatever, um, end script, uh, that's a resource, okay? Basically, everything that's between HTML tags is, is more or less considered a resource. So on, in the tree somewhere, they'll stick that script. Then the browser says, okay, what's the origin of this, okay? So what, what would you say the origin of this is? You're the browser, you're looking at this script, it's in the HTML file that you got from concordia.ca, you can see it came over SSL, so what would you write down as the origin for this? Okay, so concordia.ca would be the domain, it came over HTTPS, port 443, and we'll assume no overrides or anything like that, so that would be set to false. Okay, so that's, that's the, the origin. Um, and uh, I'm just going to drop the, I won't spell out the whole origin, we'll just think about the domain, that's probably the most important thing. <clears throat> okay, uh, here's another one. So let's say that uh, instead of writing the code itself in line, uh, what I do is I say it's in a file somewhere else. Okay, so you're on this concordia.ca uh, website and there's a file uh, called lang.js and so I, I want you to run that file inside the script element, okay? So the browser will do the same thing. The only difference here is now it has to go and get the JavaScript, okay? So before it had it, it was already in the HTML file. Now it has to create a new request, get that file, comes back, now it has the file, but it more or less does the same thing. It puts it in the tree, uh, so it's a part of the resource of this paper, and then it's gonna put an origin on it. So what origin would it put on this. So we would put concordia.ca because that's where this JavaScript came from, right? Okay, uh, so exact same uh, example. Uh, this is called a cross-site script. So you've probably heard of uh, cross-site scripting attacks, so this is relevant to that. But a uh, cross-site script just simply means that you're getting the script from a domain that's different than you. So in this example, we're on concordia.ca, it's giving us the HTML that has the script element, and the script is coming from uh, Concordia as well. Now the script is coming from GitHub uh, as opposed to concordia.ca, okay? So exact same thing, uh, the browser parses it, it sees it has to grab the script, it goes over to GitHub, it grabs the script, sticks it in the tree, what origin is it going to attach to this script? Okay. So everyone said GitHub. Anyone think it's not GitHub? Okay, so the, the, I mean, those are the two options, right? Okay, so GitHub, who thinks? Okay, Concordia. Okay, and uh, does anyone actually definitively know for sure or you're just guessing? So I'm just guessing. This is the first time hearing this. I definitively know for sure. Okay. All right, so the reason why cross-site scripting is a problem is because 90% of the room is wrong, okay? So you would think, and developers think it, and this is why there's attacks, you would think that the origin is, get, is GitHub, right? Because it's coming from GitHub, okay? But the origin is actually concordia.ca, okay? Why is that? Well, what you're doing effectively is it's as if you take the lang.js file you open the file up, you select all, you copy it, and you paste it into your website just like you did this instead, okay? So all you're really doing is saying, go to GitHub, there's a JavaScript file sitting there, take the contents and dump it between the two script tags. And in this case, this is clearly, it's in line with, with a, a, a document you got from concordia.ca, okay? So cross-site scripts, um, uh, Cross-site scripts are, uh, they run in the origin of where they're being pasted into, okay? It doesn't matter where you got it from. So uh, getting it from Concordia, 
getting it from GitHub, it makes no difference. They're exactly equivalent. It's just who happens to be hosting that file, okay? So when that, that file comes in, uh, it's assigned the origin of concordia.ca, okay? Now, because people don't realize this, it creates all sorts of problems. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what some of those problems are, okay? But the mental model you should have of this is as, it's as if you copy and pasted the code of that JavaScript in line uh, with the website itself. Um, and remember now, let's go back to, to what we said earlier, JavaScript can change the DOM tree. They can change all the resources on the website, okay? So this JavaScript that I got from GitHub, it now has the origin of uh, Concordia.ca. Everything else that's in the tree that's on the website that has the same origin, which is uh, Concordia.ca, which would be like the entire site, more or less, right? Uh, that JavaScript can change, okay? So pulling down, imagine if that JavaScript was malicious, then you pull it down, it can basically rewrite the website. It could change everything about the website. It could add things that you can't see, like for example, if you type a password in, it grabs a copy of it and phones home with it or wh whatever the case is, okay? So getting malicious uh, code into a website is very, very dangerous because it's given the origin of the website itself, okay? So it has access to all the other resources that are on that website, okay? It can read everything. So if this was like a social media, it could read all the, all the stuff that's being displayed on the screen. It can now read it. It can also open internet connections, and so it could send that information anywhere that it wants to, okay? Um, and so it can uh, log input fields, it could change the appearance of the website, uh, it could uh, ask to see cookies that are under that origin, that type of thing. Okay, now you might say, well, that, that's crazy, like, I, I, I don't want that, like, I want to run JavaScript, and if it's from GitHub, I want it to run as if it it's, belongs to GitHub, right? I don't want it to see everything else. So is there a way to run JavaScript on your website uh, where it's sort of contained, like I'm pulling in, like for example, let's say I, I want to pull in Facebook and I want them to put a like button and I want that like button not, you know, to be able to see all the Facebook data, not to see the Concordia data, right? There should be a way to do that. And so the answer is there is a way, it's called an iframe, okay? So what you do with an iframe is you basically draw a box, literally like you say how many pixels they get and uh, you say, okay, go and load this, for example, this, this website from Facebook in this iframe, okay? The iframe is like a mini web page. It's like a web page inside a web page, okay? So everything, uh, so you, normally you would load the iframe as an HTML file, but then the HTML file, add.html file would have a script element in uh, the HTML file itself. And so what's the origin of this that's being run? Uh, in this case, the origin is Facebook uh, because the iframe belongs to Facebook, okay? So if you wanna think about it more visually, scripting that's running inside the box can't see anything outside of the box. It can't change anything outside of the box, okay? So it can't reach outside of the box and, and see what's here or change things at all, okay? And vice versa is also true. So if I'm concordia.ca and I embed a Facebook iframe, I can't actually see what's inside of it. If there's a like button that Facebook puts inside this box, I want the person to hit the like button on my article, but I can't reach with JavaScript, I can't reach into the box and press the button for them, okay? Pressing the button is scripting, right? Like you can use scripting to push the button. I just can't, I can't do it because I can't access it, okay? So there's complete isolation uh, between everything that's outside and everything that's inside, okay? And so that's what the same origin policy is, is it basically says uh, if resources are from the same origin, they can access each other. And if they're from different origins, uh, then they are isolated from each other. So they can't see each other and they can't uh, modify each other. Okay, uh, great. Okay, questions about this? Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Uh, 
okay, so there's. Uh, uh, there was one example. Yeah. Like compare.ts slash m1 and one was class. Compare.ts. Right, right, right. So in the basic same origin policy pass are not considered at all. It's based only on domain. There are some extensions like frameworks that allow you to get more specific and more granular. And I'm trying to remember if they include a path variable or not, but I th I'm not sure about that. But anyways, the basic same origin policy, there's no path restrictions. Cookies there are, so this is maybe one difference between cookies and same origin policy, but yeah, it's just based on domain. Yeah, the same question, like, are cookies tagged between the iframe and the host? Yeah, so, so cookies, remember, this will be relevant because we're going to kind of see some attacks that blend them. So when, let, let's just like take this step by step. I load this website, I go to concordia.ca, I press enter, okay? I send a request out to get that base HTML page. My Concordia cookies go along with it, okay? That page comes down, it's an HTML page, and inside of it, inside the HTML itself, the, the page that I just got, there's this uh, command iframe uh, source equals facebook.com add.html. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have to get that add.html file, okay? But this time I'm going back to Facebook, okay? So then I go out to Facebook. My browser says, oh, you're going to Facebook. Let me see if you have any Facebook cookies. So then my Facebook cookies would get attached to this request. And then I would go, I would get add.html back, okay? Then I start reading add.html and I see, oh, there's this script element uh, inside of it, and it's telling me to get this get.js file. So then I create another connection. I go out to, to again, to facebook.com. My same cookies, my Facebook cookies, the same ones that would have went in this request are going to go in this request as well. And then I'll get that third file, which is the get.js file. Okay. So resources, like every little HTML thing kind of is a resource, but in terms of the big resources, there's three. In, in, so far in this example, right? There's the base HTML page that I got from Concordia. Its origin is Concordia. Concordia cookies were used to fetch that. Uh, there's the add.html file. That's origin Facebook, Facebook cookies. And then there's the get.js. That's origin uh, Facebook and uh, um, uh, Facebook cookies. Yeah? Okay. Now, this actually is it's a great question. Um, let's change this to github.com. Okay, so this is facebook.com. So I get add.html uh, in the iframe. And then uh, the, the get.js comes from github.com. What, what uh, origin would the script have? Facebook. It would have facebook.com. Okay, so that's the same sort of same question that we had before. Okay, um, so yeah. Okay, now. There's also, now you might say, well, it would be awesome if these could talk to each other, right? Like maybe it's a news article and I want to send Facebook the, the article ID that the person's looking at. And then Facebook can also say, okay, do I, do I know any users that have liked this exact article before? All Facebook might know is that it's being embedded on concordia.ca, but it wouldn't know anything else. Like what, what exact article or what page are you on or that type of thing. So sometimes you want to pass messages uh, back and forth. Typically, the more typical way to pass a message from the outside to the inside would be to just embed it in the URL. Okay, uh, so you would embed it as a parameter. Then, when you request it from Facebook, Facebook will look at the URL that you're requesting. It's, it says, "Oh, I'm supposed to send you add HTML," but then it has ampersand like. ID, article ID equals this from concordia.ca or whatever. So normally you would just put it as a parameter of the URL. Facebook will eventually see it. It will parse it out and then it will sort of know what, what you're looking at. But if you actually want to send messages back and forth, you can also do it uh, with a post message, uh, window.post message. Um, but what you need to do is you need to approve it on both sides. So Concordia has to over, they have to put some JavaScript in that says I, I'll accept uh, post messages from facebook.com and then facebook.com in the iframe would have to say uh, they'd have to have some JavaScript that says I accept uh, post messages from Concordia. Then once that's created then you can send messages back and forth and the browser will will do that for you. Again that's sort of unusual I just I mentioned it. Okay 
So because we all have uh, a weird mental model of, of how this works, it leads to attacks. Question? Yeah. Is there a way Concordia can like act Facebook like like the ice ice cream inside Concordia to use it to say that we need that ice cream they can communicate Right, right, right. So so the answer is no. The the only way it could do it is like with a message. It could just say, Hey Facebook, send me the cookie and then Facebook would send it. Would have to be programmed. But there's no automatic way to do it. And what we actually want is that from a security perspective, is we want them completely isolated. So there's no way that a cookie that belongs to Facebook will ever be seen by Concordia.ca, regardless of how complicated they make iframes and things like that in their websites. Yeah, so they'll always be isolated. Okay, so cross-site scripting is basically uh, just, uh, so we, sorry, we've seen cross-site scripting, right? Cross-site scripting, not the attack, but just cross-site scripting itself is this. Okay, so a cross-site script is just a script from one origin that's running in a different origin, okay? And then to attack it, basically the attack just comes down to, can I get my JavaScript running on your website? Okay, if I can get my JavaScript running on your website, then I can sort of hijack how the user's experiencing the website. Again, it's not changing what's, the, what's on the server end of the website, it's just, changing what's being displayed to the user. Uh, but that's almost as good as changing the server if I can do it to, to enough users. Okay, so there's different ways of doing cross-site scripting and they kind of vary from easy to hard and there's probably 100 variants. In 6.1.20 or, or not 20, um, maybe 30 or 40, I think they go through a bunch of them, so you'll see them. My purpose here isn't really, I'm not trying to teach you cross-site scripting attacks, I'm just trying to show you why they work in terms of what the same origin policy is itself. And so I'll give you three or four of the most common ways of doing it. I'll show you one super crazy way to do it that's very complicated. And it's just so that you appreciate like why it's so hard to get fixed and why even today you still see cross-site scripting vulnerabilities like a lot uh, if you pay attention to, to vulnerabilities, okay? So a simple way to do the attack would be, um, let's say that this lang.js is actually a very popular JavaScript library. Maybe it does something super useful and lots of different websites around the world use it. Uh, if you can somehow change that JavaScript file that's sitting at that target, that, at that origin, sorry, the source, um, then, then you can embed your malicious JavaScript into it and then you can, uh, and then everyone that uses that library will now run your code instead. Okay, so how could you take this over? Well, if it's on something like GitHub, you could maybe get the administrative credentials for that repository, and then you could um, you could uh, uh, change it. Um, if it's not going over HTTPS, you could also try and change it in flight, uh, but that's going to be disallowed now by browsers. They'll block that. Um, and uh, if if maybe you were always malicious, so you put up a library that's benign, that has no like attacks built into it. You get lots of people using it, and then once you see lots of people are using it, then you flip the switch and you make it malicious. Uh, so that would, that would be another way of doing it, okay? So this is a popular way. Um, another thing that people do, I can't remember what I have slides of and, and what I don't, so I'm rambling off a bunch of these, so there, there might be slides for some of these, but you could, um, you can also like come up with a library, like for example, GitHub, you can create a repository of any name. It's missing the repository usually, which is before the file. But you could choose a name that's very similar to the name of a popular library. And then when people type it in to their HTML, sometimes they make mistakes and typos. They usually catch it because they go and try and find a file and the file doesn't exist, right? But if you name squat on a name that's similar and you actually give that file when someone asks for it, then the developer might not notice. So this is also popular, not just with things like JavaScript, but all sorts of things like names of applications, like if you use AppGet or something on Linux or you use um, uh, Brew on Mac and you ask for the name of some software, there might be software that is just slightly different, common typo, and then it's malicious, uh, that type of thing. 
Um, so yeah, so you could, uh, if this goes over HTTP, then you can just change the file itself. There's no protection on it. Uh, and so this is so dangerous that now browsers will not allow that, okay? So the browser will say, hey, you're fetching JavaScript, it's coming over HTTP instead of HTTPS. I'm actually going to not run it. It's not like I'm, I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to warn you, I'm not going to get your permission, I'm just going to drop it. And it might break the website because maybe you need that JavaScript to render the website. Too bad, so sad, right? Uh, it, will just, it will just break it. Okay, another thing, uh, this is like sort of, I don't know, 1990s cross-site scripting uh, would be, let's say that you have some field, uh, like a bio or something like that, like on a website, and then what you do is you embed some HTML into that field, you save it, then when the user goes and they look at your profile, then uh, the browser gets confused because it doesn't think that this is text I'm supposed to display, it thinks, oh, this is text that I'm supposed to execute, right? This is like some HTML. Uh, kind of thing, okay? Um, and so another user will, will, will see it and then it's sitting there and it will just run it. Uh, so the basic problem here is that browsers are confusing what should be displayed as text and what should be code uh, that should be executed. There are new like web standards that allow you to like better tag like, oh, this is something that's only for display, it's not to be executed. Um, uh, this is also called, the name for this is persistent cross-site scripting uh, because it's stored on the website, so it's persistent, so every user uh, that, that, that goes to a website like this will, will run the code. Um, this is like the original kind of attack, uh, one of the, the first attacks, they called it a worm, like before we just used malware for everything, uh, but there was a social networking site, much like Twitter, called MySpace, uh, and someone did this attack, and what the JavaScript did is it actually made you friend them on MySpace, and then also post the same message on your MySpace, so anyone that visits your profile will also friend the original purpose, person. Um, and so people did it, and it created a whole bunch of extra traffic, because everyone was friending this person, and it actually brought the whole website down, and basically everyone on the social network ended up friending this person. And if I recall correctly, that person actually got charged like criminally for, for doing it. Um, but, but anyways. Um, so now, yeah, so, so like most people don't just hand type HTML anymore, usually use some sort of framework. So it's actually hard, I would say today, to, 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 to actually write HTML that would give you a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability, especially if you're using a framework, it's going to sanitize it. Uh, it's going to not even allow you to like put a triangle, like that would be a disallowed character in any text that's supplied by users and things like that. And, and then it will look for things that look like tags and maybe use like Unicode or something like that, but it will uh, sanitize that as well. And so there's lots of sanitization efforts and then there's some other policy efforts that you can use to say that this should never be considered code, should always be like display text. Okay, another type uh, is uh, what's called reflected uh, cross-site scripting. So imagine, for example, we saw this before, we talked about this RESTful architecture where uh, if I go to Google and I search for uh, CF Montreal, that query gets embedded in the URL itself, okay? Then uh, I can email you that link, you can click on it, and then you'll get the results. You don't have to type it in uh, for yourself, okay? Now, what if your query was something like script, code, you know, uh, stop script, end script, right? Then what would happen? So what it would do is it would tell Google you wanna search for this particular term, um, and so you might give this as a link to someone like in an email, like a phishing kind of email or something like that. You're just trying to get them to click on it. They click on it. And then what, you, what might happen in theory is when they click on the link, they'll see a page like this, like google.com. Uh, sorry, there's no results for. And then what Google will do is they'll copy and paste that query term and put it in, okay? And so then the query term is sitting here and then again, the website confuses code and data, and instead of saying script.code and script, it thinks that it's supposed to run it, and then it will actually run uh, the code instead, okay? So that's another way to get, uh, to get JavaScript into a website, is to look for things that are in the URL that get reflected 
uh, on the website itself and then try those parameters and see, okay? So for a long time, everyone was sanitizing user input, but then no one was really thinking about sanitizing URLs, right? And then people started doing these attacks. And so now like everything gets sanitized, including uh, anything that comes in from a URL. Okay, now again, my, my job isn't to try and, and show you every type of cross-site scripting. Uh, you'll, you'll see lots of examples in other classes. Um, but I also wanna show you kind of the other extreme. So those are like really simple attacks and then I'll show you a kind of more complicated one because what happens today is people still do cross-site scripting but the, the attacks are so convoluted uh, that, that they end up you know, being between different elements on a website and things like that but it's still a persistent problem because you have to like, um, you, have to, uh, uh, you have to take care of, of literally everything, okay? So think about this. Let's say that there's, um, you go to a website and there's some sort of a min panel, okay? So an admin panel is like for your settings. And let's say that you can put your email address in and this email address is never shown to the public, okay? So it's only shown to me, it's not a public kind of thing, okay? So you don't have an opportunity here to do persistent cross-site scripting because even if I could put a script in for my email address, it would only show it to me when I log in and look at my profile. It's not gonna show it to anyone else. So I could cross-site script attack myself, right? But I couldn't use it to attack anyone else, okay? Um, Okay, so the question, so then it was thought, well, these aren't so important. So we need to spend a lot of time when we're looking at our web interfaces at all user supplied data that's shown to other users. And if there's some user supplied data that's only shown to, to the user themselves, you know, that, that's on the secondary list. Well, we might as well take care of it eventually, but it's not like a top priority, right? So then someone figured out, oh, there's actually a way to do a cross-site scripting attack even if uh, the, it includes data that's only shown to the user themselves and not to everyone. So the way it works is, is sort of complicated, but basically it works like this. So I'm the adversary. I have to get you onto my website in the first place, okay? So I create an evil website and I lure you to it, you know, with, with email, phishing, whatever. Somehow I get you on my website. So that has to, that needs to be a component of it. Then what I do is I create uh, an iframe, okay? And in that iframe, I'm going to embed this website that has that vulnerability, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, first have you, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna say, like, let's imagine that it's in Twitter, okay? Uh, so what I'm gonna do, or X now, I guess. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna load an iframe with X, okay? And so that's fine, it will load. And if the user's logged in, then the cookies uh, for that iframe are going to go along with the request. X will say, hey, I know who you are. And then it's not going to load like a login screen, it's going to load it with the actual content of it itself, okay? Now maybe my goal is to, to take that information off of X and learn it for myself, okay? Now, because of the same origin policy, remember these are isolated. So if my goal is to see you know, who your friends are or what tweets you liked or whatever, I can't reach in from the outer website into the iframe because of the same origin policy. So it says, no, you can't do that, okay? So then what I do is uh, I load a second iframe, okay? And if we're using this sort of RESTful architecture where it's stateless, so the, all the commands are being executed through the URLs, Imagine, for example, I could, I could sign out and sign in using just URL commands, okay? So I'll create an iframe, and uh, it will also be for twitter.com, and then I'll sign out. And what that's doing is it's signing you out, the victim, okay? So now, but you're still signed into the first iframe because that fully loaded. I'm not reloading that, so it's just sitting there, okay? Now you're signed out in the second iframe, then what I can do is either in the same iframe or it's just easier to think of a third iframe. I load a third iframe and then I log myself in. I'm the adversary. I log myself in. I load that profile page that has the bad script on it that only I can see. Okay? So this frame is the old frame that still has your data on it. This frame is my frame that has my profile and my bad script 
that's running on it. Okay, so my script starts running in this frame. Okay, what origin does it have? It's in the iframe itself. The iframe is origin twitter.com. Okay, so the bad script's running in twitter.com. Can this iframe access the information in the other two iframes? Okay, so visually you might say, no, like we can't cross over from box to box. And so you, you might think, no, the answer is no, because like visually it looks like you couldn't do it. But if you think like a browser and think about same origin, this iframe is a resource. It was assigned origin Twitter. This is an iframe. It was assigned Twitter origin. This is an iframe. It's assigned Twitter origin, origin Twitter. The JavaScript that's running in this iframe, right? It was loaded by twitter.com. So it has origin twitter.com. And so all of it goes into the DOM tree for the website and it all goes in the same place. Okay. And so if you say, show me the other stuff that's the same origin as me, then yes, you can access it. Okay. So this third iframe can access everything that's in the second iframe. It can access everything in the first iframe. It's all, it all has the same origin. Okay. So then what you can do is, uh, you can basically like, for example, you can read everything that was loaded in the first iframe, uh, and then you can send it off to wherever you want. And you don't have to limit yourself to one iframe. You could load, like say you want the user's profile, you want their followers, you want their DMs, whatever. You could load iframes with all of this data. It all has the same origin. Then when your script runs, uh, then you're able to, to siphon it all off and, and send it uh, to the server. Okay, so this attack is nice because it uh, is actually a blend of uh, cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. Okay, it's cross-site scripting because uh, we ultimately get this script embedded in the admin panel that only we can see. And it's cross-site request forgery because this first iframe was populated by the real user's real Twitter data uh, because it was a cross-site request, okay? Uh, I guess technically it's not a forgery attack because you're not forging anything in their name. Uh, but, but anyways, it, it, it's a cross-site request. Forget about the forgery part. Um, but you request the information cross-site uh, and then you use cross-site scripting to, to actually read it. Read information that you shouldn't be able to. Okay, uh, here's another attack that's uh, sort of related to it. Um, th actually, let me put it a different way. Uh, this is an attack that's a, a very different attack, completely different, uh, but it sort of is a different way of achieving the same type of thing, okay? So imagine uh, that you have a website. I lure you to my bad website, and uh, I create an iframe. Facebook populates it. There's a like button. And what I really want to do is I want to reach in and I want to click that like button, okay? Can I reach in and click the like button? I can't, why not? So same origin policy. So I can't just directly reach in and click it. Uh, could I use a cross-site request to do it? So I could in a sense, like I could ask for this iframe to be, you know, go load facebook.com and, and load like action like or something like that, okay? Now Facebook aren't dumb and they realize that. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll program their like button in such a way that you cannot like a page with a cross-site request, okay? You have to actually click on it. Like there's no, that's the way it's programmed, this program that you can only uh, kind of click on it, okay? So let's say, let's take that as the assumption. So the only way that this like button gets pressed is if the user through the user interface puts their mouse over that button and clicks on it, then it gets liked, otherwise it doesn't get liked, okay? Is there anything that you can do uh, in order to get the user to click that like button? Yes, I can put another thing over side. Okay, great. All right, so I can uh, reach in and click it, but what I can do is I can create some other image and through the power of HTML, uh, even though that iframe is populated by Facebook and I can't reach into it, what I can do is I can layer things on top, okay? And so if I layer it on top, now there's an image, okay? Now the next question is, well, what happens if you click that image? Does it, is it like, like you can click any image you want, it doesn't do anything, right? But does it, does your click like go through the image to the button below it? Or is it just like kind of clicking on an image? Like maybe you click and drag and it drags the image. 
right? So some people say yes, some people say no. Um, so the first thing that's possible I just want to emphasize is that you can put the button over there. Even though the iframe underneath, you don't control it, you are allowed to layer things on top. You control all the pixels. You don't know what the pixels are that are underneath you, uh, but you can put pixels over top. And then the answer is, well, you can actually configure it. So when you create the image, you can say uh, on click, you should like click the image itself, or you can do what's called a transparent click. And a transparent click is uh, if the person clicks on it, then the click goes through the image and it goes to what else is underneath it, okay? So visually, you make the image opaque, meaning that the, the, you can't see through the image. It's not a transparent image because you want to hide the like button. But then you make the click transparent and then people will click on it, okay? So when this like first started happening, I remember it was actually at a time when Facebook was very popular uh, and people were like, I got hacked because I logged into my account and I liked all these like spam things or I'm posting spam things like that. Like someone guessed my password, okay? But the truth is that probably no one guessed your password, right? Probably you went to a website and it did whatever it could through cross-site requests, like make you like an article, maybe, maybe even make you post something or repost things like that, uh, whatever it could do. And then it tricked you into clicking on it and then you clicked on it. So no one actually broke into your account. They don't know your password or anything like that. Uh, they just got you to do actions under your name with what's basically a cross-site request um, type of thing. Now, this is actually pretty easy to combat. Transparent clicks have almost no useful purpose. Like, if you just go and look at a website and ask how many images have a transparent click, and it, it actually is there for a reason, it's basically like 0%, right? So now, if you go to a website and there's even a transparent click at all, it will, you know, it, it's considered, uh, you know, malicious or whatever, almost by definition. Um, so, for example, I think that ghost tree extension that you looked at uh, for assignment two, uh, I think that's one of the things it does is, is uh, you might not have seen it, but I think if you go and load a website that has transparent clicks, it will start warning you and complaining about it. Okay, so the click is transparent. It clicks through to whatever is underneath, which is the Facebook like. And if the user is logged into Facebook, then uh, using a cross-site request, uh, then the click can actually do real things on their real profile, uh, even though they don't know what's, what's happening. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. So if the website is also the same, like you mentioned about the X, X request. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so what you mean is like uh, if I if the website is evil.com and I create an iframe for evil.com, yeah, then uh, everything that's in the iframe itself and everything inside of it will have the same origin as the outer page. So then you can reach through it. And so normally, sometimes you might do it like like normally you wouldn't point an iframe at yourself. Uh, the reason you might do it is like say you're trying to populate a box and it's easier to create a separate HTML file just for that box itself. Like you kind of want to embed HTML from one file into another file, but you want it like in a, its own window or like sub like frame within it. So that's, that's why you might typically do it. But yeah, in that case, then uh, the origin is the same. Okay. Uh, so lessons uh, from browser policy, so both cookies and uh, same origin. Um, okay, so it's hard to get these policies right. Part of it is, uh, actually one thing I should mention that I didn't, uh, when I brought up cross-site scripting, let me go all the way back. Okay, so we, we go back to this example. Uh, and remember I asked everyone GitHub or Concordia and everyone thought GitHub and not Concordia, okay? So that's something that's unintuitive about the policy. Now you might say, well, what, what if you did it the other way around, okay? So what if you define the same origin policy to be, hey, you got this JavaScript from GitHub.com, so it should run, you should put GitHub.com as the origin, right? Then everyone would have the right mental model of it, right? So there wouldn't be this usability issue. Okay, but does that actually make sense? 
So what, why, why wouldn't you choose to do that? Like if you could wave a magic wand today and say, we're gonna change the same origin policy. And so things that, that are pulled down, uh, so you pull this JavaScript down, it's actually gonna run in the context of github.com on your page, right? Why, why would you not wanna do that? Sure, that's true. So what does JavaScript do? It goes in and it like looks at data, changes variables and things like that. It would be changing the variables for, for GitHub itself, right? And so if you if I want to make changes to GitHub, like again, these aren't like persistent server side changes, it's just on what's displayed to me. But all I have to do is I just have to put my script somewhere on GitHub and then I can run it on my website, which has nothing to do with GitHub. And then all of a sudden it has access to all the variables and things like that for GitHub, right? It doesn't make any sense from a security perspective, okay? So that's why the same origin, it has to be the way it is. There's no other, there's no other way to do it that, that would be secure. So anyways, this is like um, things that we, we, we like to think about that counterfactual. Okay, so it's hard to get these policies right. And by right, I mean that they uh, both do the secure thing, but they also are easy to use and people understand them and people use them right, okay? People get confused by cookies. Uh, they get confused by cross-site requests. They get confused by cross-site scripting. They get confused by the same origin policy. People make mistakes because they're confused, right? And then we get lots of attacks as a result. And so now we're kind of at the stage where you don't get to touch like the website of a major company unless if you take in a lot of courses on like web design and things like that and that will include some security in it and you're going to know what cross-site scripting is and things like that. Um, so developers, they want to have the right sort of mental model of the policy. And uh, the, the other kind of flip is uh, you can also create policies that are very secure, right? But uh, people also want to do stuff, right? Like you could just turn off cross-site requests and say you're not allowed to do a cross-site request, period, right? You can display things in the context of your own website, but you can never do anything cross-site, whether it's a script or a request. But then you can't build interesting websites, right? You can't have code that's external. You can't have iframes. You can't have like buttons and things like that, right? So you want to balance security and functionality. A lot of things in like the way that the web came about because these policies were set in the 90s is there was an overemphasis on uh, functionality. Like just make it work, right? Let the developers do the cool things that they want to do. Less emphasis on security. Now it's like kind of dialed back the other way, but, but we've had to like do a lot of like fixes or implementing additional policies and things like that. So there's a tension between, um, between uh, functionality between security and then also simplicity, which is like the user can understand it or the developer can understand it and know what's going on. So it's hard to get a balance between those three things. Um, okay, there's methodologies for like, if you wanna know whether your website has cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you can use static analysis, right? So there's some methodology where you can automate some algorithms that will look through it will turn it into some decidability problem and it will try and answer whether it is right or wrong. It might have false positives. It might miss things. It might have false negatives. It might flag a bunch of things that it thinks is cross-site scripting but is not cross-site scripting and you have to go through it. But there, there's methodology for that, okay? But what about the policy itself? The cross-site script, or sorry, the same origin policy itself. How do you analyze that policy and say, is this the right policy? then you don't have any good methodologies, okay? Some things you can do is, um, I might have it, um, you can, I mentioned it before when we talked about like airport policies and things like that, is you can turn policies into code, like into logic basically, logical statements, then you can do analysis on it. So um, there was a nice paper that looked at the same origin policy they modeled the same origin policy uh, using an analysis tool that's called Alloy. So it, they turned it into logic and then they found a bunch of vulnerabilities. They found like three vulnerabilities that no one had ever seen before. They were really complicated. It was hard to get to them, uh, but they did it because they, mod they turned the policy into programming 
or into like a bunch of logical constraints, and then they were able to ask questions like, "Is it ever possible that that you should you can do X and you can do Y, even though they know the policy shouldn't allow it?" And it would say, "Oh yeah, there's actually this one instance where if you do exactly this sequence of events, then you're able to do it." Um, so that's one methodology you can use, but it's it's like it's really hard to do. And if you model it wrong, if you make a mistake in your model, then uh, it doesn't prove anything in the end. Um, and it's, it's hard to do the modeling. Uh, it's also chart, the other hard thing about policies is uh, if you want to change them later, okay? So like things like, like the post message between iframes, that was added later because people said, we want different origins to be able to talk to each other. So then you can kind of retrofit things like that in, but sometimes when you change things, it breaks things. So that was okay because it was another, it was a new protocol, a new thing that was layered on top of everything else. So usually you just keep adding policies on top. It's hard to actually like change an existing policy. If you change it, it's going to break a lot of things. It's not impossible. So like one change that was made was blocking JavaScript that comes down over HTTP. So that was a change. Browsers decided to do it. Chrome did it first. They, they gave a deadline. They said, we're going to do this in a year and you better fix it. And between now and a year, we're going to give lots of warnings. Every time a user tries to do it, uh, we're going to warn the user, right? And you're going to get complaints, you know, from the user that, that things aren't, that they're getting warned all the time, right? And then the, the deadline came and went and they flipped the switch and then, you know, and it probably broke lots of websites, but they didn't say broken for long uh, because people want their websites to, to work. But anyways, there, there was a lot of like, Chrome could do it because they're big, right? Uh, but, but not everyone is able to do it. And, and most people agreed that it would be painful in the short term, but it would be good in the long run uh, to do this type of change. Um, okay, and then this is the point that I made earlier, which is developers generally just want it to work and so they'll do things like they'll always set the origin to be the highest level domain that they can, right? They'll set their cookies to be the, the, the highest level domain they can. They'll turn off all the security flags, everything like that, make it most permissive. Everyone can see everything, you know, that, because it just works. And you go into developer forums and things like that, and people are like, I, I can't get, you know, I can't see the cookie from here. Everyone's like, oh, that's easy. Just, you know, override the domain and, and make it the super domain or whatever. Um, so, so generally, that help, that, that's what, what happens. And again, this sort of goes back to having the right mental model. So developers don't want insecure websites at the same time, but they also want things to work. So if you can give them something they understand and they can get it to work and be secure and they can understand that it's working and why it wasn't working before, if you can thread those three things, uh, then, then, then it works. But it's really hard to get to that level of policy. Um, and then if you keep layering new policies over top, over top or like you can override, you can't do that, but you can override it. Or, you know, you, you can't do that, but then there's this new thing that does allow you to do it and things like that. That just adds a lot of complexity. And there could be new vulnerabilities now that, that you aren't thinking of because you, you add this stuff. So you have to be careful, like just, just adding a whole bunch of stuff on top uh, in order to, to make it work the way you want it to work. Uh, okay, so that's actually it. So this was something that uh, we talked about last class when we had 13 lectures this year. We have 12 lectures because we have a spring break, so we're not doing the ethics class. Okay, so that's it uh, for today's lecture. It's it for the course. Uh, I'll take any last questions that you have about today's lecture, about the exam, about anything, anything anyone wants to ask. It's your last chance. Yeah. Um, be, let's say between 35 and 50, something like that. Uh, sorry. I didn't. Oh, our written part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there'll be, sorry about that. Um, uh, th there'll be a short answer questions as well. Yeah. So I mentioned this at the start of class, but you'll, You'll get two sheets of paper. One will be the question sheet. There'll be some short answer. You'll answer it on the question sheet. Do it in pencil, because you have to bring a pencil anyway. And then you'll get a Scantron form for the multiple choice. That has to be done in pencil. Uh, and yeah, you could, if I do more short answer, there'll be less multiple choice. If I do less short answer, there'll be more multiple choice. So 
Um, yeah, so I haven't written the exam yet. Um, so yeah, not sure. But. Bring a cheat sheet. You can write anything you want on it. Uh, and that's it. And then watch the website, and I'll put the uh, I'll put your room assignment. Maybe I'll I'll email you or something about that. It's not so important. You can show up to the wrong room, and then we'll it'll be written on the board what room to go to. And they're in the same building. They're just above each other, so it's um, it's not a big deal. But yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Sure. Both multiple choice and, and short answer could involve coding. By coding, I mean like you should be able to read like a s small snippet of code, like the kind of thing that was in the slides. Like, yeah, you won't have to code something from scratch. 100% not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the submission date? Yeah, yeah, so the, um, uh, where is it? Okay, so I, I'll say it again, just because it's kind of confusing. If you yourself are graduating this term, or you're working in a team and someone on your team is graduating, then hand it in on Monday. Then I'll mark it before the exam, and then as soon as I have the exam, I have your final mark, I can post it right away. Uh, and then for everyone else, submit it by Friday of next week. Uh, it can go on Moodle. I changed the deadline so you can now submit it up to the deadline. And uh, um, yeah, that's it. The, the, the rest of the stuff is in the project itself, the description itself. Uh, sorry, you said the project and the report? Uh, so it's possible. So I have in the past asked questions like, so for example, when we talked about ethics, I would always ask like, what's your project on? And tell me what the ethical considerations are. So I, I won't do that because we didn't cover ethics, but that was, uh, that was like the first question of a bunch of exams last year. Um, so I might do that this year, like try and I have to figure out a different way of asking about your project. But, um, but yeah, that's the, it's possible. I'm, I won't rule it out. The other thing, by the way, for the projects, I, f I forgot to mention it. I think I mentioned it somewhere, maybe in the project description. But if you're in a group, only one person has to hand it in, not all of them. It doesn't matter who. Everyone's getting the same mark. Uh, you don't also have to say who did what or anything like that. If I see four names, I mark it once, and then I copy and paste that mark. I will consider, though, how many people did it. I mentioned that as well. But anyways, in terms of who actually puts it on Moodle does not matter at all. But try to put the student number in the file name. It just makes it easier when I download them all. If I all have, if I have like project.pdf 50 times, then it wants to overwrite it and it ends up being a mess. So, so put your student number in the, in the PDF itself, in the file name. Okay, any other final questions? Okay, so remember, no office hours tomorrow, but Monday I'll have office hours. If you have questions, I'll talk to you then. Otherwise, I'll good luck studying and uh, yeah, good luck finishing your whole career or your whole like term because it's. Uh,